So again, yeah, now now it's on. <laughs> okay, that was my fault. But um, good. Um, like I explained to you, we are very happy to have you here, and there's many people watching at home. Um, but you're the lucky ones who uh, uh, are um, uh, aware of the fact that it's good to be in the presence of each other. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss tonight. We're going to talk about um, what it is to bring art to a stage and what it is actually to do that in the presence of people. It's one of the main topics of tonight. Um, this is the first episode of the Hugo van Berkel Artist Talks, a three-part series in which Joel Gamsu, yes, please do come in, in which Joel Gamsu, uh, uh, under my uh, uh, guidance, I would say, but <laughs> talks to another internationally renowned performing artist, and tonight that's Ivo van Hove. Um, we try to have a conversation on uh, what it is making art on stage. Um, you're both world famous uh, for making art on stage as a director and as a, um, a, com um, a conductor. Conductor, yeah, I was going to say a conductor and director. Um, um, we will have uh, two more talks in this series. Um, uh, Joel Gamsu and I have been talking about this series for a long while. There's been a pandemic in between, but we're happy that we kick it off now. Um, and um, tonight, um, Ivo van Hove, born in Belgium in 1958. I don't think you need much introduction to this audience. Um, I would say you are the most um, well-known uh, director in Holland, in Belgium, in Europe, and probably uh, one of the best directors in the world. Um, there's many sort of um, prizes and laureates you, you, you got, but uh, you're known as an opera director and stage director, of course, and have been um, leading the Toneelgroep Amsterdam, now called ITA, uh, from 2001 onwards. Thank you for being here. Um, and Joel Gamsu, born in 1987 in Israel, 88, 88, that's right. Um, uh, 32 years old. He grew, uh, you grew up in New York, London, and Tel Aviv, and um, you started to play the cello at the age of four, I understood. Uh, 2006, you founded the International Mahler Orchestra, and um, at the moment, you're among many other things, you're a director of the theater in Bremen. And the 1st of September, um, the opera, sort of performance opera, will uh, have its premiere of Marina Abramovic, um, and you're conducting there. In Munich. In Munich, yeah. The Opera House in Munich. Um, both to w welcome, welcome to everybody here. We have several fragments. Um, uh, uh, ask you to, to, to bring several fragments which we're going to show around here. Um, maybe to start, you will. Um, um, do, you, do you think that um, doing, bringing art to the stage is all the same thing or is it a totally different thing than what Ivo van Hove is doing? Are you in the same, in the same boat? I think that you can always find differences and you can find similarities. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm really happy to be here. I'm extremely sorry that some people see my back, uh, but it's kind of the nature of a round table that it'll be round. And I'm extremely happy to meet you. Actually, it's funny that we've just literally met 30 seconds ago, but I've been a huge fan for a long time, especially since I, I got to, actually I got to know your work through Lazarus, which I've, I've uh, brought to, to Germany after, of course, your, uh, your first uh, sort of premiere in, in New York and London. And I'm, so I'm really, really happy it worked out and very, very honored that you came. And um, I think you, you will, it's the main, if you look at the, on the surface, the main difference would be that, of course, the director prepares a performance until the moment the curtain goes up and then has the very, very ungrateful task of letting go, which I'm really, really happy I don't have to do. And for control freaks as neurotic as myself, then you have the chance to go and terrorize an orchestra on stage when you actually go on stage. But then I have to learn to let go all the way in the process. So I guess that's, you could say that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the differences are. And then again, um, I think all arts, especially all performing so arts... So are you saying a director is not really a performing artist because once it's on stage, it's not, no long, he's no longer there? I think the de definitions of what art is and what a performing art is have changed, thankfully, so much over the past 30, 40 years that the whole idea of, uh, let's say, boxes of what is theatre, what is movement, what is music have been, thankfully, broken for a long time and hopefully will be more so in the future, that it's very, very hard to and unnecessary to build these walls of, because the moment somebody's standing on a stage, the moment actually somebody has a, a statement to make, and actually the moment somebody's gone through the process of, let's say, trying to process certain, certain uh, information and then tell a story, and all I'm trying to do with music is tell a story, then you're all in the same boat. It's just different ways of expressing that. And so I, I think that actually we should broaden the box rather than sort of uh, narrow it down to the differences. Yeah, but you're happy that you, um, as a control freak, are still 
on stage being able to control the performance? Well, you would have to define happiness, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would, if anybody, ever, to any, def- any, any conductor or any performer ever told you that he's happy when performing, they lie or they suck, excuse my, my language. Oh, really? It's it's of course, it's something you need like a drug to do. It's a, it's the only for me. It's my only way to actually process life, mm-hmm. and it's my only way to to express it. And it's a need, but it's not fun, as in that kind of sense. It's a it's a need, and also I think one of the biggest topics is to ask ourselves. I mean, I you know you meet so many artists that say I do it because I have want to give a big present to the audience, and I think it's it's a lovely thing to hear when when somebody says I play the violin because all I want is Mrs. Smith in row seven to be moved. And I'd, it's great, especially in the U.S., people love saying those things. And I think it's, it's, there is a certain part of that which is sort of sure, certainly true, but ultimately... <laughs> especially in the U.S., okay. Good. Sorry. <laughs> you read between the lines yeah. there. But um, I'd say that the honest truth is that most of us, and I can speak at least for myself, started at least started out because of our own need to relate to the world in some way. And if, if I ask myself, what is the reason why I make music? Of course, it is, first and foremost, because I believe or I think this is the, the only situation or the situation where can people most come in contact with their own emotions, which is why I think it's so crucial as a, as a, as a separate space from everything else we're doing. But of course, there's a hugely selfish side of it too, which is my need to come close to my own emotions, which I can only do while, while on stage. So, and then of course, where is the moment where, because an actor who is doing it for his own uh, let's say pleasure is a question of how much space is left for the emotion of the of the audience. But then we're entering now 14 different topics. So I'll just keep, go back to you. Mm. You want one more question? Um, because and then I <laughs> would ask Ivo van Over uh, uh, certain things. But one more question. You're just saying um, it's the moment. If I make music, it's the moment when I am in contact with my emotions. Mm. Aren't you? Are, so are you the other? period of your life sort of slightly handicapped in that respect? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's the only level and mm-hmm. the only situation where I can truly be in harmony with myself and truly be vulnerable as well to whatever comes in and goes out, absolutely. And I don't believe in any, any sincere artistry without vulnerability, so absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, in- interesting. Um, <laughs> Evo, <laughs> a lot of things said, but I was actually starting out with um, um, is, the, is it the same sort of thing um, being a, com- a conductor or a director uh, because you know it's all doing art on stage in the presence of an audience yeah but he's totally right I'm never there when, when the performance exactly. is actually happening yeah. well I'm sometimes I'm there you're there not physically yeah. and not you know I'm, I'm not you're doing not anything. on stage no. I'm, I'm not, no. not even doing any, anything then no. so that's that's the, the excitement, but also the challenge of what I have to do. Yeah. I have to make sure that people really know what they're doing on stage. Yeah. And that there is a story that everybody sticks to. Uh, and at the same time, the challenge is, listen, I'm, 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 I'm one of the directors that I don't like to uh, watch my own performances too much. I do it because it's, you know, actors love it when you come back and when you are there. They love it and they hate it. Mm-hmm. When I come into the dressing room, I feel that I'm not welcome. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm very welcome. Yeah. It's a very complex situation. Mm-hmm. And so I, I learned over the years to, uh, I, I used to, to be very detailed when I went to a performance and in Den Bos or whenever where we played, you know. Uh, and I used to give a lot of notes, very detailed, uh, which I don't do anymore, for instance. I learned that it's not so important. If you really rehearse the piece very well, actors know what it is about. It's different with music because I happen also, I did, well, some operas with with good conductors and not so good conductors, but also very good conductors. And that's a very different thing. I can can understand very well that, that well is saying that he is in connection with his emotion because the only time that I cried in my own productions that I made myself where you know exactly what's going to happen because you know exactly this is going to happen now she's going to step uh, you know everything mm-hmm. so it's the control is in opera much goes much further than in, in theater I think well that's my experience anyway mm-hmm. uh, 
But the only, but the only time that I, for instance, when I did the Gotterdam room, the Trauer March, when it started, you know, I always cried. I don't know why it happened. You know, well, Wagner, the Gotter, Wagner, Gotterdam yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. It's always happened. Mm -hmm. it, it only happened in, the, in, the, in a play of mine, and I did a lot of plays in these 40 years. Yes, you did. Only mm -hmm. once. You know, it was with Little Life, a few years ago. When it suddenly it, overwhelmed It me. was Couperus. No, no, that, yeah. Little Life small, was Hanya. Small, no, no, the other one. The, Hanya, Yanni, Yanni. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, th th that's the only time in the theater. Mm -hmm. Never it happened in the theater. But in the opera and in the, in the music, uh, it's, it's, the, yeah, it's, a, it's a different language. It's two languages. It's a language of words, but it's also a language of abstract notes and all these things. And I cannot read notes, but I learned how to, to deal with the score. I know but words are music too, in a way. Words are music too, yeah. In, in any way, in my theater, it's anyway, because in my theater also, you know, it's, it's a lot of music always. I, every, it's, I, I consider every play that I do as a music theater play. You know, there's music almost all the time. When there's silence, you really hear it, the silence. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it is. So I'm, I'm really deeply in touch with music. And mm -hmm. I, uh, so that's the difference. He's there and, and, also in an opera, sometimes I come and then the opera lasts three minutes or four minutes longer than the day before. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's it's a living, it's a living, it's a living thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in in the theater. Sometimes it's shorter, you know, and, and you don't know why. And so it's it, it, it's the same. But for me, in my job, it's different from him because I'm never there. I, I'm not necessary to make the performance happen. If I die. A lot of performances can go on that I've made without me. But they will also change from night to night. And that will change from night to night mm -hmm. to night. And when, when it's in the hands of good actors, it will be fine. And, um, but you say, I don't really like to, um, to be there actually when it's played out. Um, is that sort of the same emotion you will was referring to when you said, well, happy, if you hear somebody say that performing art is that you're happy or that you're that it's n nice to do is that sort of the same emotion because then it's finished are you are you happy when it's finished or are you are you, are you <laughs> that it's or over. is it torture <laughs> <laughs> no it's not torture no i don't know i learned to live with it I, it's really it I sounds this pretty bad. my life no it's not my no i learned to live with it and i mean it in a positive way okay like i learned to live with everything in my life you know in the morning, for instance, the, my partner, he knows that I'm a little bit, a little bit grumpy. You know, it is, I'm not get, getting out of the bed, bed, out of my bed like, oh, it's a wonderful new day. You know, it's like, no, I, I need to have an hour, three quarters of, uh, you know, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? No, it's me. And I learned to live with it. I don't push myself. And I know within three quarters of an hour, it will be fine. You know, that's what it is. So I, I never have meetings too early in the morning. I try to avoid it. And I, I don't, don't say, you know, things like that, because that's not good. I like to be on myself. So th and that's the way, listen, but I consider m my life in the theater as my life in the theater. And the theater is also, it's, it's a big, big, big part of my life. As pro probably music is a big, big part in your life. As you said, you said that you're closest to your emotion there. So that's, that means that it's a big part in your life, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, and it's the same with me. So. I learned to deal with the upsides and the downsides of it. What's the downside? And I mean it, in, I, therefore I feel very at ease in the theater. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, even in the opera, which, which in the beginning could be a little bit of a, of a, a, a difficult world, in, because it's, I, uh, when I did the Wagner in the beginning, you have a lot of people. Uh, th 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 there was a guy that came in and he's, he's, he was singing uh, Voltan and he came to me and he said, well, I've, si I've been singing this 50 times. <laughs> I said, 15 times? No, no, 50 times. 50 different Five productions. Yeah. So he, that was just a message like, I know what I'm doing, so mm. uh, uh, back don't, off. Don't it's back so true. Off. I, it's yeah. so true. I have this yeah. every week and it's this kind of... Um, don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. There is one piece, and we're doing this one piece, so I know how to do this piece. So what are you even here for is the subtext. Sure. And I, I completely relate to what you're saying, because I've done most of my life. I mean, this whole opera business is something that I've been doing for the past, let's say, five years now, six years. I've, I mean, which, considering I'm super young, is still quite a big part of my career, but it's for the very, very first few years, all I was doing was symphonic concerts and, let's say, projects that revolved around 
pure music, let's say, because I, I don't know how to put it in a diplomatic sense, had my problems with opera, to put it mildly. Um, I never would never go in my free time to see an opera because usually I find the singers incredibly vain. The stagings have not changed since 1955, and if they have, they still look like they haven't changed since 1955. Um, then the vanity that most of the people involved actually put in and kind of hide it within we are just doing the piece is something I found very hard to relate to because it's like there is no such thing as the piece. The piece is a piece of paper. I mean, and everybody went like, how can you say that about great Mr. Verdi? And I was like, no, I'm saying it out of admiration for Verdi. The first thing he would want you to do, as Shakespeare would have too, is to turn it into a living art and not create a museum for it. And they would go, no, 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 but it's, it's sacred. You know? And so my first experiences in the opera world were terrible. I mean, and also like most conductors, I don't want to speak badly about my colleagues, but most conductors, I mean, it's, it's, I find it really hard to relate to that. They show up t three weeks before the premiere. Well, then, um, then you're lucky. Right. And then they go like, oh, you know, in German they say Gesamtkunstwerk. I don't know, you can, yeah, you can translate that to... That's a to, Dutch word. Yeah, and it's like, what, 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 what kind of Gesamtkunstwerk? We've been planning this piece for six months, and not, not a year and a half. You show up for the last three weeks and say, I conduct what's in the score. And you go like, so... And then they say, well, the staging should say the same story as the music. I was like, how is this supposed to happen if the conductor is absolutely not interested in any way in actually telling any story? Because there is no way to tell the story of a piece. Every story we tell on stage is an interpretation by definition. So, and I mean, on the other hand, of course, I find it, I don't know what your take on that is, but lots of, in working in Germany, very hard to work with directors that can be just as, let's say, vain in another direction of saying everything that is in there is shit and I'm going to do it differently because I know better, which where at the end there is no storytelling at all and this is no storytelling in theater, I don't know why I'm going to it. So, but in the very beginning of my, th my opera world, I felt like in a zoo <laughs> because I have all these like singers, the first thing they tell you is everything they cannot do. And then I was like, okay, so you cannot do this, you cannot do this, you cannot do this, but good morning, very nice to meet you. Um, maybe we start and see. No, 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 but I've done this before. I know how this goes, and it's like this, like this, like this, and not like that, like that, like that. Okay, but, but are you, um, if you are, um, if you're I'm saying... too negative. If you're saying that you are, um, that you are, you think that it should be storytelling, what, what are you, and that you um, are in contact with your, emo your emotions while conducting, what is it that you bring? Me is personally, it, no. Um, one. Um, uh, if you make uh, um, a performance, is it is it entertainment? Is it what 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 is it that you try to bring to convey? Well, I think entertainment is a word that is so has such a bad reputation. But I think if, uh, in, among most of my colleagues, I think if I've managed to entertain somebody on a high level, I've achieved a lot. Mm -hmm. I think there is a huge degree of arrogance among my colleagues who think, oh no, if I have not created great art. Then this, I mean, entertaining people, with, mm -hmm. if I've managed to create a story that moved somebody, that made me make them introspect for a minute, that maybe just made them experience something they haven't before. So, so that's the thing you set out to do, to entertain or to educate, or what is it? What is it? Why? I definitely don't set out to educate anybody. No? No. I don't think people pay money to go to the theater to get educated. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very an incredibly arrogant 1968 German approach to theater making. Um, no, 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 absolutely not. Um, I, th I think there's so many things, and as usual, it's like a combination of many things, you know? And I think the moment that, the most important thing is the moment I have a personal need to tell a story, then it's already moving for people if it's honest. It first of all, it has to start with my need being real and authentic. And if that is the case, then the likelihood that people will be able to translate that into their own stories in their own lives is very big because most stories ultimately are similar. And that's why with opera, we're you know, talking about all these like old productions, new productions, you know, modern, not modern. Ultimately, all human stories are so similar and so close that we can take an opera from 1850 and it can move you and you and me as if it was written yesterday because we all have the same problems. Is that what you try to do, to move people? Yes, of course. Is that what you but uh, try to do? Setting but out no, to do? Listen, but I, it's our job. Right? So it's not like I, I try to move you. You know, it's like <laughs> I... First of all, I have a rule, since I was very young, that I never accept, uh, because sometimes in the opera, you're asked to do an opera most of the time. So as a director, you do, you're not, most of the time you cannot choose no. an opera. But you can choose as director of ITA, you can. Yeah, yeah, but in the opera world, that's different, you know? Then you're asked to do an opera, and, and then, I waited until I was 40 to, to do my first opera, that was Lulu Alban Berg, why? Oh, wow. Yeah, why, because I'm a theater director, Lulu is a play that I've done here in Amsterdam. Yeah. I knew all the characters by heart. 
Uh, so I also knew what Alban Berg had done with, with the material because it was an interpretation of Alban Berg of the Wedekind. It's not Wedekind what, what he did. It's really Alban Berg. And then, so I understood that opera. You know, I understood it. And I had, perhaps you know him, he was a pianist, a very famous pianist, the Kontarski, uh, Kontarski brothers. There was, and one of them got, uh, and he was, a, well, he, he knew that by heart. Uh, so I waited because my first rule is never do something that you don't believe in or that you don't feel for 100%. You know, I never do that. I never take a job. You know, I never, I, I can really say that I never ever did that. I always did something that I totally believed in. And that's important, you know, so because if I don't really believe it, I if I just do it for the money or for what reason, whatever, you know, for fame or I don't know what, you know, if you just, uh, how can you ever confront this, all these difficulties you, which you will challenge? You know, because I had a lot of people saying, no, I cannot do this because this and this and this. And I said, yes, I think you can do this because this of this of this of this, you know? And so, so if, you, if you're not convinced, why bad, why, go into the battle. Mm -hmm. why, why fight that war? And convinced about what? Convinced? Listen, and that's the second rule. We're talking about opera now the whole time because, okay, no, okay. But, but the second rule, the stage, second rule for say. a theater director is if, you re, if you're not passionate about music, don't do it. Just don't do it because you will fuck it up. Shouldn't say this. Ah, yeah. that's okay. But, but, and, and, twice, don't worry. but yeah, but because yeah, and that's what I mean. So when I when I sometimes I'm asked to, to, uh, for an opera that I don't know or, or I've seen it once, you know, but too long ago. So what I do is I never le read read the libretto. Libretto is a text. Yeah, a text. I never do that. I, I listen to the music, and meanwhile I, I I never do it without the music, because in opera, for instance. Well, Wagner is the best uh, example. Eh? You have a dialogue, and the dialogue goes on for 40 minutes. And on paper, it's only two pages. Yeah. In, in the so theater, that, yeah. would, that would last so a few to minutes. So listen to music and don't read the text. The music, yeah. the music is already an interpretation okay. of... Because of the timing, the rhythm. Yeah, I, I always... I, I always have the feeling when I do an opera that there has been a, there has been a director before me. And that's not the conductor, but the composer. That that's the director who has been before us. Mm. Of course, we also have to do so, a, a job because, as you are saying uh, very eloquently, is that every time or me, I have a different vision on how that. Because is there, if there is a forte, I can simple. If there is a forte, I learned that the forte you can have tens of interpretations how to sing that. Mm -hmm. And that's when it goes well between a conductor and a, com and a director and a singer that can create fabulous things. If a, 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 a singer is open to it, if a conductor is really interested in that, and if a director is also open for that experience. Also, I had a wonderful experience with uh, Vladimir Zhurovsky. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did Boris Godunov with him. He is Russian, of course. It was very scary for me because I don't Russian, because, but I studied it. But, you know, I was open to him and he was open to me. And we had a wonderful collaboration. So that was one of my great experiences. I'm not going to name the, the bad ones. You know, because <laughs> no, I'm that's, not, gonna no, do that. that's but, not necessary. But, it's, it's nice to talk but, about... Yeah, but that's a necessity. And, and a lot of people are too lazy to to explore that experience because it's it's easy because I could I can be a director sitting here and the conductor is sitting there you know and, and we can easily do that separately mm -hmm. but the, and this the is magic kind of happens, happens when it goes together but yeah. but you're saying don't do anything if you're not convinced and that's true for theater and opera and for but if you're convinced about what convinced about but that's and that that's doing emotion what no that's emotion emotion that you Feel that that something you feel with this it? piece, I understand it, and I can do this, uh -huh. and I can really bring something to the table, mm. perhaps which hasn't happened already. And you, you, you. Oh, that's very interesting. That, so you, you have the. Idea well, that's fame. The, that's fame. That, that, <laughs> that's a little bit fame, of course, huh? because you think that that's with Mozart, well, that, I can I do something I, different. I, yeah. mm, okay, but at least you have the idea of the hunch that you can add something to that yeah. play. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't do it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the same if you choose I could, I mean, he or? speaks out of my heart. But this is basically, you've just described the problem of my life. So, uh, being which a conductor, is? which is the, the difference, I say one and other, let's say, practical difference between conductors and directors is directors have the great privilege that they can only do 
if they're sensible, two, three productions a year, if they're less sensible, let's say five, six productions a year at the most. As a conductor, you're under pressure to basically work theoretically, because that's what the industry think you can do, every day. And so theoretically, because you can go somewhere and just show up two weeks before the premiere, you could theoretically do quite a lot of productions You per could year. maybe do 25 or something. Right, which yeah. is, and there's a lot of people making money on the way, so there are a lot of people will, who will try to pressure you to do that. So what's the, and what's, the, and I'm getting what's the problem of your and, life? And the yeah. more, I'm getting there. So, and and the, the biggest problem, uh, or the biggest advantage for those making money from of you working a lot, is if you have the largest possible repertoire. Because if you go somewhere and you have to conduct a piece for two weeks and go to the next place mm -hmm. and conduct another one, you need to have... To if you know do many many pieces then you're great and me who basically i don't know how many agencies and opera directors and houses i got into trouble with for saying i know these five pieces and i need another three years to learn this piece and i'm definitely not doing this and this and this and this and this and this piece which as you just say they ask you as well they call and say would you like to do this and i was like mm, so sorry it's an amazing piece but i have absolutely no understanding of it whatsoever. so the problem is that Choosing the problem is that I, you become no. a troublemaker because I, you say, I said probably nine out of ten so times no. So the problem no. is saying no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. the problem is the trouble that you get, the pressure that you get of why, mm -hmm. are you, why I'm difficult because I don't go and do any and piece. Do you, do you recognize what Ivo said, that um, um, you choose things, you do things which you think that you can add something to it? Or... I think the adding part is a very complicated word because, I th and I think we probably mean the same thing in different ways. But it's a question: What do you mean by add something to it? Um, in a sense, the moment you perform a piece, you add something to it, whether you want it or not, mm -hmm. because it goes through your filter. But for me, it has to do with insight. If I feel a connection, if I feel a relationship inside the material in what? into the piece, mm -hmm. then I feel that I can at least, as the doctors say, not damage. But um, in a sense that. There are so many pieces. I mean, Wagner, for example. I know Wagner is great. I have zero, zero empathy with Wagner. I don't get it. I look at it. I, I, I recognize it being incredible. And I understand nothing. So why should I go and conduct Wagner just because somebody pays you money for it, you know? And for me, it's been a, an absolute rule for me, too. But it's very hard to push that through, especially in, a, in an industry that when you let's say, work on a certain level can make a lot of money out of you, that not to refuse a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I think that the main difference between what a director does and what a conductor does, which I find problematic, or one of the differences, is that as a director, everybody kind of expects you to come and bring a new vision. Because the moment you put something on stage, it is already different because you're not going to have the original production. As a conductor, there's this whole idea that you're supposed to be true to the score. And then how do you want to do a Gesamtkunstwerk, as they say, with one of them trying to be authentic to the score and the other one trying to do something new? So they're already, by definition, going to two different directions. And usually those directions are absolutely not coordinated. So you failed before you started. You know what I mean? And that's when you say add to it, I think I agree completely, but I think... Um, the difficulty is totally different because um, what does it mean to add? I mean, I think that with, before you even start, you have added something because you've given your life story and your, everything that you've experienced automatically to the piece. But with adding, I just mean, the, I think the word not very well chosen uh, uh, is that at least that you have a vision on it. You mm. do, that you know why you want to do it and that you can give. Because, listen... Notes are notes. They have to come alive. You know, you will bring exactly. the notes alive it's together with the orchestra. It's right. just, and words are the same. You know, so, and if without a vision, it will be dead material. Then it will be dead, even when you sing it. Which is why and the idea that you can be authentic to a score is by definition not even possible. No, because there is no objectivity like, to that's that. That's the point. And when you have a conductor come and tells you, oh, no, I'm just doing what's written in there. It's like, there is no such thing. There is no objective definition of what is a forte. There is no objective definition of what is an accent. Everything is an interpretation. Is the same true for if you do Shakespeare or what? Is yeah, but even that's, that's even, that goes even further. For, for, for instance, if you Why? have the, the, fir, uh, the simple words, I love you, mm -hmm. in the score that would be indicated, for instance, as a forte, yeah, well, then you cannot, you. Then yeah. you cannot whisper it. But in a theater, it's not, nothing is, most of the time, nothing is indicated or very uh, 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 vaguely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you can yell it, you can shout it, you can say, I love you, I love you, I love you. You can, I, I can go on, you know? Mm -hmm. in, in the limitations in opera are a little bit narrower, mm -hmm. you know, because there is things indicated, but in this indication... And then you have this new level yeah. that, you can, that you don't have in the theatre, that through the music and through the abstract as aspect, you have so many options that you don't have in the text, so it's basically you gain and you lose at the same time. Yeah, at the same, in the, indeed. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of space for the director. Or like, like to because every word has a different possibility. In the theater, the yes. Yeah. There's endless possibilities. Yeah. You know, yeah. I remember I had once, uh, one of my first productions in opera was with a theater director, wonderful guy, and great, great, great director who used to do mainly, mainly theater, so I think his second opera. And he's like, what am I supposed to do with people that say, I love you, I love you for 20 minutes? And he's like, nothing's happening. And the fact is that thing, the main difference between theater and opera is that timing yeah. is prescribed. I mean, you can talk a scene as fast or as, sh or as slowly as you find, see fit, in the music, it, if the composer decided that it's going to, you're going to stretch it over 20 minutes, i.e. And you have to discover, if, if you don't have the vision, that you understand why it takes 40 minutes, the dialogue between Wotan and Brunhilde, just don't touch it. Don't mm. do it. Exactly. Just stay away from it. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have that fantasy, imagination and vision, you just don't do it. But what fascinates me is that you both have the idea that you understand or at least you have the hunch that you will understand, that you will be able to really add something or interpret it in an interesting way before you start actually doing it. Yeah, of course. Otherwise... So where does that come from? Yeah, but that's also in opera. You have to decide, I don't know how it is with you, but, but well, normally I would now be in New York. Well, that's a production that I have presented already two years ago. <laughs> crazy and and that i was asked for in 2016 which production would that be well yeah okay but uh, okay <laughs> it, 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 it's not so important it's now, not important but, okay. but so you know, that's that's the other difficulty from opera you know the most of the time you're asked to do a production years but in the international theater it's also some two years before but in opera it's much longer mm, even yeah. but how and that you, means that means that you even have to think better and make up for yourself, really, I but will do this. But how do you this. know that I, you... I will be interested in this yeah, exactly. in, in two, three, four, five years' time. That's the thing. Yeah, and sometimes that, you're that, wrong that, also. Sometimes yeah. you think you will be and you won't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you take on a project and three years later it happens, you go like, oh, God. So um, I'm trying and to... all the other way around. But I'm trying you, to get you know. what it is to, be, to, be, to, to make something creative or maybe even new on stage. You know, where does it come from? Um, and I understand that's very difficult not to point that out because if you would no, it's the material, it's it's the music in an opera, and of course the, st the story has to make sense. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, but and and in the theater, it's just you read that play, and, mm -hmm. and you 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 know you you fall in love. It's for me as simple. You have to fall in love. Yeah, I, and actually, that's exactly in what love, I thought when you started like saying that. Yeah, exactly. You know it's it irrational. actually when it happens, mm -hmm. and then afterwards. Of course, it's his job and my job to rationalize my falling in love. It's Why do I fall in love? It's rationalizing and yeah, You have to because choice. you have to talk. When I did Boris Shodanov, there was like 140 people on stage who I have to communicate with. I cannot say, I'm so impassionate. Uh, you, know, I, I'm so, you know, I'm in love, so be in love. It's yeah. not possible. Huh? No. You, have to, you have to find words to talk about your love and your passion. You have to inspire people, you know, even people that think, well, you know, it's, that's, what, that's my job. And, and this is the same with, uh, with, I think, with the conductor, it's not different. So how you, how you, do you have a plan for that, to inspire them? A uh, plan, but... But because you, like you're saying... Of you, course I have a plan. Mm -hmm. So you have, like you're saying, you, you cannot simply go there and say, listen, guys, I'm really inspired. No, but, but I have, my plan is basically, uh, in the rehearsals, is very simple. Namely, I've discovered that, that all these people are individuals. So I try to figure out, if you would be in front of me, I try to figure out how do you want me to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. That's what I try to figure out in the first days. That's what I try to find, you know, how to deal with this person and this third. I don't deal with, in a chorus, that's, that's a difficulty with choruses, yeah. because it's much more difficult to do. But even with the chorus, I always go into the chorus also. I give an explanation for everybody. Then half of them have, uh, didn't listen. And then you have to make, <laughs> yeah, but it's true. <laughs> and then, and then uh, uh, you have to go into the core. And so I go in and then I, I don't, I never know names, but that's also, but that's not a problem because I, they know that I know them. And I say, you know, you have to be there. You have to come here. You have to, this year. To, so then, then it's like a one-on-one -on -one person, even with the cars, even when it's hundred people. So it's, it's a very intense uh, thing, but it's the same in theater for me. In the, in the theater, I do the same. I, I you know, 
Yeah. It, it's if I work with Isabelle Huppert, for me, it's the same as working with, with Hans Kesting. That means it's different. She, I deal with her in a different way as I deal with Hans Kesting, you know, because yeah, it, she is a different person than Hans Kesting is. But for me, so my attitude is always, I try to be personal, individual. And how, and how do you know if you're directing people, there's a scene, um, whether... Um, I, I recently saw your uh, Freud uh, 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 part, which I thought was a wonderful, really, really wonderful piece of piece of art. But there's a lot of movements on stage, very sp specific. You sit on the table, you lie on it. You, you. Yeah, but that's, how how yeah. do you know how yeah, the actor should hold his body? Yeah, but I, well, that's one of my. That's one of the few talents I really have. <laughs> It's, it's a little bit like if you ask a painter, how do you know you have to put blue on the yeah. canvas? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I know. It's, it's, it's really the, something. <laughs> if I, they do, they, that's why they became painters. Oh. I think Ivo was trying to answer the question. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I think it's a little bit the same. You know, it's like I never prepare a staging. No, in, in the old days, uh, uh, you, you know, I, even when I went to school, when I, so that's not that long ago. It's, uh, we had to prepare a staging. You know, I, I never, I always refused it. I'm the only director that, that, the only one that has become a director afterwards from all the students, but uh, because I, I wouldn't know what to do. But if, 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 if this would be my set, I would, I would enter, I have a text, I know where somebody has to enter. I, I just feel it immediately. It's like, that's a talent. Well, that's just a talent. And I'm very aware, and I've, of course I have, this, uh, I have a fabulous scenographer, who I work with, who makes sets that I really understand. I really understand what, mm -hmm. where, to be, where to be and where not to be. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, a choreo it's, it's, choreo it's like a dance. It's, it's a choreography. You can feel it in your body somewhere. I, I never prepare. Listen, I have sometimes moments in a production, you mm -hmm. know, where, but I never prepare he or she is coming there from the, not even in opera, which is scary some, because there people sometimes expect it that you know exactly, you know, but I, I try to make clear in the first two days of rehearsal that I, you know, I'm very well prepared. Mm -hmm. I know, you're very, very well prepared. Yeah, but yeah. don't expect me that you know, that, I'm, that I know when you have to, to, to take a sip from your glass and I don't know. <laughs> That's rehearsal for me. That makes it human that makes it personal that makes it that makes also that gives also liberty uh, to the to the actor to the singer to bring something you know because a mm -hmm, lot of the singers of these days the, these the times have changed eh? there's a lot of great singers that are really also in, interested in acting uh, uh, the, 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 so not only in the singing but also in telling the story mm -hmm. uh, I should I should tell you know m I had a fabulous cast, for instance, in, in, to, last year, two years ago, uh, Don Giovanni in, in the Paris Opera, which is not so easy because normally there is all the people that, you know, but it, I had a fabulous cast and it was a, a real collaboration as it was in the theater. So that exists also in the opera and more and more and more, I think. That will, you're the lucky one because you're young and you will, you will have this whole future with people that really want to collaborate, I think. Would you happen to know what, I mean, how you decide as a conductor where it should be more forte or less or to get the orchestra as enthusiastic as you are about the scores? I think the, getting them enthusiastic about something is something that happens between the lines. It's, it happens, it doesn't, it's not about what words you say to them. The moment you have to explain, you explain the technicalities, but the, you convince them in, a, in the subtext, you convince them with your body language, you convince them with the fact that they feel you're honest. Mm -hmm. And an orchestra smells whether you're honest within 30 seconds. And then you can do whatever you want. If they don't trust you, they won't trust you. And it's over. And it really maybe takes two minutes if you're very complicated. But it's, it's, it's as simple as that. And then everything else you say, it's, they can disagree with or agree with. But it's, it's an instinct thing. But I think when I heard, well, let's listen to what you were saying. I completely relate to that. Because for me, it's about making a plan that prepares you f or gives you the tools to then deal with the unpredictable. So I learn a piece, so I know everything that's in the piece, to then go and I make every decision in the moment when it happens. So I need to have all the tools on my side to be able to react to what people are offering me within seconds, to all the different possi possible ways that I could go, based on the knowledge that I have on the piece before I came, but I don't come with a fixed idea because that means that all the people I work with are exchangeable. 
So it means that I already know at home, if I already know at home how it's going to be played, it means that the orchestra is just a machine. And that's not the case. So I need to prepare, prepare myself completely to have all the options to react to individual things happening. And it, that's why when I perform a piece different times, and even if it's the same piece, it will sound completely different at every single time. So I think it's about being able to embrace the unpredictable. But that's, that's, you need to be as well prepared as you can in order to be able as free as possible. That's at least how I feel. Mm -hmm. I asked, we asked both of you to bring a piece which uh, you thought when you were 18 was really inspiring. Um, I think, well, you brought um, uh, nothing personal. I brought two films. Yeah. Um, can we can we can we have a look at the pieces when you th you thought you were um, as, a, as a as a younger as a young person um, being inspired by nothing personal? And Ivo, you brought. Um, I think Marina Abramovic, didn't you? Yeah, well, that's yeah, really yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what it is. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting. Um, could we, um, I'm going to look at the, at the technicians. Could we have the fragment of the first fragment, nothing personal? Please, uh, can we have a look at that? Where are you going? I'm just going. Why don't you stay and work for me? You can leave anytime you want. That's right. I won't ask you anything, and I won't talk about myself. Okay, deal. Just one question. What's your name? I want you to have this room. Make it stop. You're just not the type to do it. You don't know me. You brought also another piece, but I prefer not to All right. look at the two, yeah. That's okay. to look at this one. Um, uh, maybe we can also look at the piece Ivo van Hoven brought, Marina Abramovic piece, if we can. I never have had a relation with a woman neither with a man, of such a degree of symbiotic quality. So 12 years while we were burning up. The Marina Ulai collaboration in a simple, direct and profound way expressed the male-female dynamic and then reaches this kind of epic conclusion with the walk on the Great Wall of China called The Lovers. It's beyond operatic in its proportion. The Lovers, in which Marina and Ulai walked the Great Wall of China, was an epic. The three months process of walking towards each other, very simple, really pared down and extraordinary in its clarity. This was the last of their relation works. 
And of course, the way the Great Wall walk ended was with their splitting up. We very soon we become this great art couple when everybody was projecting like a perfect image. In reality, he was not happy with this position. And somehow, the more better pieces we've been doing in the performance, the worse our relation will get in, in private. And later on, it's like his interest was different than my interest, and he was really kind of experiencing life, go for drinking, go for the drugs. And then he become unfaithful, which was very hard for me. We were monogamous till a certain point when the tightness of that ideology started to unravel, started to disintegrate a little bit. Then she had at the same time a sexual adventure with somebody like I had, the same time. Except she did it with a friend of ours, I didn't. Wow, shouldn't have said that. It took us about eight years of negotiations to get permission to walk the Chinese wall. And during the negotiation, many times he had to take a trip to China, and she was a translator. And when we finished Chinese war, he told me that uh, she was pregnant. And he asked me what I should do. I said, what you should do? <laughs> you know, I leave and you do whatever you want. So they married. It is like, you know, like it began. It ended like it began. It began like this and it ended like this. That's all. After I split with Ulai, it was the most dramatic moment of my life. I remember writing in my diary, I was 40, I was fat, ugly, and unwanted. And I said, God, I lost men I love, and I lost my work because it was working together. It was nothing there, it was empty. And I was like a new beginning. Um, we could be watching this for a long time, but um, um, uh, we we're just choosing a fragment out of it. Um, thank you both for bringing those two pieces. And you didn't know what the other was bringing, of course, that we didn't have any contact with. There's a lot of um, similarities in the two fragments, I would say, um, uh, which I think, I think is striking. But we asked you to bring something which inspired you when you were around 18. Um, 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 could you elaborate on what you thought in that period that really well, but Got performance you. art was, well, anyway, we're talking about the 70s, huh? mm -hmm. and the second part of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. And that was like a new thing, uh, well, for me anyway, you know, coming from a very small town in Belgium and, you know, I didn't know about it. So for me, when I saw these kind of things, uh, and because the arrow is a real one. Huh? It's, it's a real like arrow. A fake, yeah. It's like a fake one, so you can really... If the guy uh, uh, thinks, oh, Kill. I cannot hold it, then you're dead. Uh, uh, I had another option, you know, as uh, I had Chris Burden, uh, and he really has himself shot. You know, he stands there and he asked his one of his best friends to shoot him. Yeah. You know, in his, you know, but it can go wrong. He would be dead. So, for me, performance art really opened my mind in a certain way, and still does up till the day until the day of. Every day when I work in the theater, I'm aware of it. So still for me, I always search, even in an opera, even in a theater production, for the moment where the theater or an opera becomes a performance art piece. What does it mean? It means that it's pure reality. Because walking for thousands of kilometers, the Chinese wall is real. You have to do it with your own feet. You have to walk it and they are doing that. And the fact that they are doing it for real, that expresses something. Mm -hmm. In this case, it expresses, well, you can, yeah, I'm not going to give my interpretation because that's not so important, but it expresses something. And that's what performance art does. It, it's full of, uh, it, 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 can, it can explode your, your mind with fantasies and with, with, imagine, with images 
and, the, and somebody can just be drinking a glass of water for two hours, you know, like slapping your face, you know, slapping each other's face. It's, they're doing it real. You see her also at the end packing off a little bit like it hurts, you know, it's like real. And that influenced me a lot in my theater in the beginning days, but it still does. I always have a moment, I love, for instance, in a theater play, and I, uh, you know, to go out of the theater, you know, like have a scene out of the theater, you know, like in, on the street. Suddenly, mm -hmm. and then go back into this fantasy world that we built. Mm -hmm. But I love this, the moment that something becomes yeah, real. Becomes pure reality. So the moment of performance Abramovich becomes Abramovich says at a certain moment, you know, in the theater, the blood is like ketchup. Mm -hmm. in, in my performances, the blood is blood. Yeah. That's, can, can, the, can we that's have a, a difference. Can we have a short look at the, at the other um, uh, fragment, Chris Burden, number six, is that possible? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> we cannot see it again. Uh, it has to be real. Yeah. Um, and why, why did you bring? I, before I tell you that, I really have to quickly say something about it because it's so fascinating. You've just literally described the one thing I've been actually dealing with for the last six months because of Marina, actually, which is the fact that for the first time in her life, she's actually doing a theater piece where she has to act, and everything Marina has always been good at is being real. And at the age of 74, for the first time in her life, she has to be not real. To act. To act. And the thing is, the whole th conventional theater, the way we know it, is basically an agreement that we all make when we go into that hall, that what is happening on stage is fake. That's the basic agreement of theater. And I find that actually what you described <laughs> fascinating, because that's what happened in a way in the late 20th century, that for the first time, it's like, okay, what if, how do we, actually, can, can, it, can we do things on is, stage? Is, is that true, that... It was what we, for what, what we do on yes. theater is fake. It used to be, but that's why I was saying. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that's was my search. You yeah, know? exactly. I think, how the... can I make theater as performance art? Exactly. Without it being performance art, of course. Of course. Yeah. But that's yeah. exactly what yeah. I was getting to. Like, I mean, it, it started changing at some point. But for, let's say between from since the antique times until about 30, 40 years ago, that was the the, the, the case. And the, the great or the extraordinary thing about performance art was that it was not anymore uh, a story that people were acting that you knew how it's going to end. It was happening right there in that moment. It's and, happening. Yeah. And, and it's real. It's about those people. It's not me acting somebody else. And, and now seeing it happening the opposite way, Marina, who's been doing 50 years of this, whose strength is exactly, I mean, her work from 2010, where she just sat on the chair for three months and watched people, was, and, and this is not, I mean, it, it was real and it was extraordinary. If you see her, you, you know why. I mean, her presence is extraordinary because it was really her and it's really real. And then suddenly she finds herself for the first time in her life having to act and realize that as if it's like a magician that lost all his magic. Mm -hmm. And that's quite interesting because I'm dealing with the opposite process and then here you say that, and it's like in the middle of what I, it's like, just I had to say that. But, but isn't it quite weird because theater is interesting because it is real, because the actor is there. He's a real person, it's not film. He's really there. Yeah, but for instance, the performance so that he's referring it? to that's, that happened in MoMA in, in New York, a few years ago only, uh, and then this guy, Ulai, yeah. well, she had, they had been broken up, and after, I don't know, but a long time, they've never seen, so she's sitting there just at the table for people that haven't seen it, and you have to, to buy a ticket, and then you can sit across- In front of her. The, yeah, the in front of her for present. a minute or two yeah. minutes, I don't know, and, and one after the other comes there to sit there. At a certain moment, you know, after weeks and weeks, he is showing up, this Ulai, and then she starts to, because that was the fragment that I also had but in, in mind, but okay, you, you cannot, you have to make this. Uh, but then choice. she starts yeah. to cry. Yeah. You know, and then you have, to, then the, he has two minutes, <laughs> you know, he has, so he has to go. So then the next person comes, but she's still, and you feel her, you know, like she's, she knows, he, uh, the, uh, you know, I'm here, I, I should come, uh, focus on the next person, but this was so emotional to her, clearly, you know, so she closes her eyes, and <laughs> she, once she, uh, very, she looks at the other person, she closes her eyes again, I cannot deal with it, and then she's open to the next person again. So it's really, for me, that's big theater, you know, mm. that's really amazing theater. 
Yet at the same but time, the more human it doesn't get. Exactly, but it comes from, an, from an, a real intention that is not, yeah. that's the point. And that's exactly what I meant with being vulnerable, because the moment you make yourself truly vulnerable, and I think great acting is, regardless of whether it's fake or not fake, it is about making yourself vulnerable. In that moment, it becomes real, and it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter at the all if you're Hamlet or if you're John yeah. Smith. The difference is, and the difficulty is also, that actors have to do it several times in a week. Yeah. And that's one of my big challenges, which I, I had to, I learned that very early uh, when I started directing is that sometimes I felt that when I said something or some or I brought some, somebody in a certain situation mentally or psychologically that I felt I there is something that I heard now there is a, I, I touch something which is and then I stop and because in the theater in a performance art it's great in a theater piece, it's not usable because they have to do it seven six seven in, in, a, in America eight times a week how to do that, how to, to open your scar into an open wound. So that's the difficulty about the theater, that you have to make it belief, be, believable. So you have to get as close as possible to bring that moment so that for the audience it's believable. But then and, comes and on top the, of that, the situation but, that... But, but you, you stop as a director at the point where you think you're yeah. hurting the actor. Yeah. And on the other hand, you bring... Because it's, it's useless. But you bring, on the other hand, two pieces in which we haven't seen one, but in which the performing artist is really shooting in himself or could be shot. I mean, yeah, the, the, the performance where... So that's the, the point arrow. where I want to get to. Mm -hmm. But I know that in the theater, it's a very... Yeah, it's, it's an... I, I, I give myself an impossible challenge. That's what it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, but you're inspired by that performance, but yeah. you, you, you don't... You, recoil from doing that to, a, because, a, to an actor because it's dangerous. Listen, Roman tragedies, we played since 2007 until last year. How many years is that, 12? Mm -hmm. How to do that, you know, in, as a performance art? Yeah. So, but that <laughs> would be possible. dangerous for, for, the, for the actor. No, it's just not possible. It's not possible. I mean, the thing is with performance art, which you not forget, is that they never, ever rehearse that. Mm -hmm. There was no rehearsal. It happened once, and no. it could never happen again. No. And if he came again two days later, it would not be the same thing again, because it can only happen through the fact that you know that it's only happened this one time. But with music, that's different. Can you, can you night after night repeat that real emotion, or is that no. like the same can, as an actor does? You always go on stage with the aim to be as vulnerable as you can, and, and vulnerable in the sense of not... I think that's what you were also saying. It's a, it's a hugely important point, because the moment that it's just you're too busy with your emotions, there's no space for your uh, audience anymore to experience theirs. So I don't need to see an actor doing self-therapy on stage either. So it's about how, how far do they go where them acting still... Evol like, evoke something in me rather than them just because there's a moment when they're too busy with themselves that you in a way also shut off as a, as a, as a viewer and with music it's it, in a way it's about being vulnerable and allowing this to happen yet not being too self-indulgent about if you are in your emotion but nobody else is experiencing it nobody gets anything out of that and so you always go on stage with the intention to be as vulnerable as you can as honest as you can as open as you can but you're not a machine you know if you do a concert three times in a week different spots in the piece will be special. Sometimes you just have an, an off night. Um, you're still professional, as actors are, and you still do things that probably many, many people won't notice that they didn't go, but people do feel, and that's the thing that I find important to re realize, that if, if that moment, a special moment happens, people, even if they don't know what it was that happened, they do feel it, that something happens in that moment that is unique, and you can't have that every night. Would you think it's a pity that Marina Abramowitz, at the end of her career, stops? doing performance and no, actually... No, I should be there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually acting? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know what they're doing. and I, I don't know, you know. I'm always open. I, I'm interested in seeing that, you know, how she's got to do that. Yeah. She doesn't know yet herself. No. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's interesting because she's, she, she started this project not knowing what's going to happen. It's the same, a little bit the same like when we start every performance, we don't know how it's going to turn out. And she sort of had this concept, and as knowing her, by the end of it, when we get to the premiere, which is in 10 days, it'll be completely different than everything she'd planned. So, uh, and now she's struggling with going back from all the acting that she's been doing for the past three weeks, and going back to actually just being herself on stage, which is incredibly hard. Why did you bring nothing personal? Uh, well, I had, to, I had to think for a long time about pieces of art that inspired me when I was... 18. I had to cheat a bit because I was 19 when I saw That's it. Okay. Um, it was just, yeah, when you're... But, um, and it's tricky because there's so many things that sort of inspired me then that are just as present today. 
And there are also so many things that inspired me for very, very personal reasons that I don't think anymore are any particularly great pieces of art. And then I had to think of that one film that actually, so after I saw that film, <clears throat> which was, actually it's a Dutch, Polish, Irish production. It's like a co-production. Yeah, the, the, the actress is Dutch. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And so, um, and actually after I saw it, it was a short time after I had a big crisis in my private life, and I was incredibly moved by that film. So actually, I didn't even have a driver's license. I went to Ireland and decided to look for that house. Because the thing, something about that film, about the way nature is shown in that film, I had the feeling it was basically a love affair between three beings. It was him, her, and nature. And I just wanted to experience something in that. There was something about it that totally fascinated me. And I just came out of this, as I said, of this relationship where, where, where I was wondering what symbiosis, again, is about and all that kind of thing. And I took a bicycle and started cycling through Connemara in the west of Ireland looking for that house, having no smartphone and uh, no idea where the house is, except that it's there. Did you find it? I did, after two weeks. Um, so asking random farmers in the street, like, I was like and showing did, them. And what did it tell you when you found it? Nothing or a lot? So the, the house was locked, the gate was locked, and I left a piece of paper on the gate, this is not a joke, and said, um, I really like your house, I saw it in a movie, I would really like to come get to know you. And of course, did not expect to ever hear from them. And then like three hours later, I got a call on my phone, and this lady saying, well, in the beginning, I thought you were a creep, but then I thought, if somebody leaves a note on music paper, maybe he's a nice creep, so if you want, you can come and have tea. I didn't even notice it was music paper. It's all I had in my bag. So I just wrote, and then actually, so I came and had tea, and ever since, I've, it's been quite a few years. And I think sort of just the, the humbling experience of sitting in the, in the, in the west of Ireland and, and seeing how nature is completely overpowering all those human issues that we all have made me understand the love story in that film and made me understand lots of things about my own life. And it was just very, very forming at that time. Both fragments had a man trying to shoot a woman. In them. <laughs> That's in your <laughs> mind. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that telling that, you know, you choose things where um, um, you're trying actually to hurt or, or, or draw blood? Yeah, but you, if you had shown my other fragment, you mm -hmm. know, which was my first thing, it was above, you know, then you should have seen a man shooting another man. But sure. also shooting indeed. Sure. Uh, in this case, uh, let's rephrase. A human being trying to shoot another human being. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's not a central aspect of the movie. If anything, it's just about closeness and vulnerability and boundaries between people and how, what, ident what a role identity plays between two people trying to allow closeness to each other. Is that what you do with music as well? Trying to allow closeness? Yeah, in different ways. Between, I mean, if you're particularly lucky, then it can, it, it's a, it's a multi-dimension thing. It happens between you and your musicians, between the musicians among themselves, between the musicians and the audience. That's ultimately the goal of bringing people to a condition where they can be as close as possible to themselves and to each other. But. Um, it should never become a didactic thing when you try to bring people. Sometimes, you know, it's just people having their own space can also create incredible experiences. We, all, we also asked you to bring a piece of something which you would have liked you've made yourself or could be jealous of about or to, uh, which is very inspiring now. Or you, you could, um, you both brought um, uh, also... Um, uh, you, you brought one, you will um, imagine, John Lennon. Can we listen to that?
<laughs> the best part of the third verse. Um, um, I, I would have imagined, you know, you being 18, thinking this is sort of, but you're still very, very inspired by this. Why? Oh, absolutely. I, this is not for the being 18-year-old category. No, no, no. This, this is, is for now. Um, this is for being jealous about it's you know, for, a you perform. said a piece of art I wish I would have created. I had to think about that a long time because I don't actually wish I would have created anything except what I will hopefully create and hopefully get a little bit better at it from time to time. But if you think about one thing that I find so extraordinary that I wish I could have had the spirit to understand and create, and then it's, then it's John Lennon. Because for me, probably the biggest influence and the biggest uh, role model for me in my entire life, and probably one, not one of the greatest musicians that have ever lived and greatest artists, but the person that has given me, as somebody that was born years after he was killed, um, the greatest example of truthfulness and authenticity as an artist. And I think um, probably he is the artist that is most present in my daily life and has been. I mean, I've, I've discovered, I think, Imagine when I was like 10 or something. And it's been equally present. I'm actually doing a big John Lennon project now in October. It's been equally present every day of my life since. Because I don't know a single artist that was so true to himself, so vulnerable, so true to his willingness to show himself with all his contradictions and be authentic and true to his own imperfection. And through incredible simplicity, I mean, imagine, if you look at it from a musical point of view, it has two chords. It's like the opposite of Wagner. It's like pure simplicity and it's like, you could say almost banal, yet it managed, to, it moved probably more people in the past 40, 50 years since it was written than any other song in history and it's so simple. And I don't think there's any, I know any piece of art that I find as as honest and as far-reaching and how something so, such, such a core comes from such an honest place, can reach so many people with such different issues and different life questions. So because of it, it's so simple and it can move so many people. It's more simple than most pieces of art, but it's... It's simple, but it's not... Uh, simplicity is... A, I mean, I look for simplicity in my work every day, and it is, I, I, I perform very complex pieces and try to look for the simple ideas and stories behind them. So mm -hmm. simplicity is not something I see, I, I see as a, something bad. No, no, it's, uh, it's something that it can to unite. You know, I've always asked myself this question of... You know, we were talking about entertainment before, whether art... How can art entertain yet be, is still art? How... Why is it, for example, that, you know, um, let's say, very complex productions and pieces of art done in places that are heavily subsidized are sometimes a lot less effective than things that are just there to put out there to, to entertain people. It can be so, many, so much more effective. And in a way, you could say it's a pop song by a man who's had no other intention except just writing a song that he liked about something that was important for him. And he did, the, did so with two chords. Yet he managed to reach millions of people that projected on this song their own lives. You did so with 100% musical integrity. That's what I meant with simplicity. It's the opposite of Wagner. You, you look like no, he clearly not. hates Wagner. I love Wagner. <laughs> <so that's, yeah. laughs> because I think also Wagner is sometimes, you know, it's long, but it's, it's, it's simple in, it, in the fact that it's, you have a long time of dealing with that music, which I, li which I like. You know, it's like long melodic lines. So for me, it's also it's complex because it's with huge orchestras. You have to do it, and it's layered. But the, he layers it in a way that it becomes one sound. Mm. That's, I think, what I like most about Wagner. You know, it's in the 19th century that he it's just almost visionary. You know how music became one sound and not notes. Well, that's what I like about it. Yeah. Um, you brought uh, Ocean Wong. Yeah, but I misunderstood the question. I understood the question as what is your inspiration at 18 and now? Yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's now. It's, absolutely. It's, and Ocean Wong is, as Marina Abramovic for me, like, uh, he is an, an, an example of a few other authors, you know, at this moment, it is, which are young authors. Uh, they are all between 25 and 35, maximum 40. And they started, and, and, and Ocean uh, Wong is uh, Vietnamese, but was raised in America since he was two. There's another guy, Tesh O. Uh, he was uh, from Taiwan, Taipei, but he was raised in Malaysia. Uh, and then there is Edouard Louis, of course, uh, uh, who is French. And, uh, well, he went from the north to the city. That's a smaller space, a, a, a immigration, you could say, but it's also like a, And they, they, well, let's first look now. But it's a little bit why. It's like, 
an example of a generation of new authors. Under 30, yeah. Well, yeah, more or less. Around. Oh. I'm angry, um, of course, but I don't write with rage. I can't. I think rage and anger are energies. They're raw energies ready to be recycled and reused. But if we use them, anger is a force that extinguishes the wielder as well as the world. I'm more interested in using the, the energy of compassion and understanding. I'm at my best when I say, I'm angry about this, but I need to know why you're doing it to me. One of the things that I think many people appreciate about your work, in addition to your beautiful language um, and your sharp observations, is that you're also very honest, I think, about some of the the dynamics within your own family, at least as described in the book. And there was brutality there, yeah. if you don't mind my saying, that yeah. there are many ways uh, that your mother treats you yeah. Yeah. that are very difficult to read yeah. and to think about your experiencing. And I have to ask you, what, what do you think about that? I, I think writing helped me understand that although you can technically be a victim. You can be a victim of war. You can be a victim of domestic violence, child abuse. But whether you live in victimhood or not is up to you. We can't change what happens to us, but we can change how we live in order to have a successful life. And I think one of the great power of writing is that when you can take your story and present an alternative future for where it was headed, you ultimately take control of your life. And yes, we all experience terrible things. You know, the women in my family suffered from war. The poison of war entered them. They passed it down to me. And I, I, I like to see it as this is our species-wide endeavor is how do we change what happened to us into how we live better? Mm. That's the great, great conundrum. What's your relationship with your mother now? It's quite beautiful, mm. you know? I never thought it would be this, this lovely. What I learned from, from these refugee women is that you don't have to talk it out. That's the great Western myth. <laughs> you know, you got to talk it out. You got to get a therapist, lay it all out. And I think when I see them. Um, you brought this fragment because uh, we asked you to, some, to, to bring something that inspires you at, at, at the moment. And it, it, I'm, I'm really uh, very impressed by these young new authors. Because, Edouard Louis, yeah, Ocean because they are they are like, uh, for instance, what I like about Arthur Miller, who is considered as one of the greatest Biggest playwrights, playwrights of, of the 20th century, yeah. that he can make us a very personal story and a very private story, but make it into something that is universal and mm -hmm. much. Yeah, that's what these guys also can do, and also there's women also uh, among them. That's what they can do. Uh, they, all three of them, because them I know very well, their work, they write their stories that are very personal to them. They experience them. He's talking about a war that's, of course, the Vietnamese War. And the, the book that he's writing about it, the, the grandmother is really traumatized by that, by that war. And he says, the poison is given to me, and I have to deal with it. And I, I, I know this. So they are very much aware of their history what they're living. They write about people that normally are not written about in our century, you know, in the 19th century they did that, about people that are poor, people, not glamorous people, you know? And it's, it's personal, it's about people that you don't know, really, and at the same time, as he does in this fragment, I think, very well, he, he, he places it in a much bigger historical situation. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing, I think. When you're so young, 
And when you're so wise, when you know that your traumas, that you can use your art, because that's what he is yeah. saying. That's what he's saying, yeah. He's saying, I survive and I create a, an imagined world, an imagined country, you know, because I don't want to give in to that poison. I want to make, so I think that's amazing. I should, everybody that doesn't know the work, I think you really have to read it. Edouard Louis, Tash All, don't forget it, and uh, Ocean Vuong, great authors. But you can choose uh, not to be a victim, he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and which, which? That's, that's, that's for him, the mm -hmm. case, and that gives hope. Yeah. That's what it is. I refer to a little life, well, in life, Hania Yanagihara writes the opposite. She says, you never can escape your trauma. You never can escape. You will die from it. Yeah, but you're more... So that's two opposites. Yeah, you're more inspired by the hope. No, 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 because a little life, you know, it's one of my okay. beloved... Uh, <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting that it's coming back to also to John Lennon in a sense. It's about people always writing or producing art about something that is their issues or their topics or those, the things that are their challenges. And if they're able to strike a tone that other people can relate to, then they project on that their own stories. And in a sense, it doesn't, by that point, it doesn't even matter anymore whether it's about him or not. He becomes a vehicle to, for other people to, to experience and go through their own processes. And that's, that's a unique gift that some people just have to be able to phrase it in a way that you can read that and you go through something that you, that you empathize with that without even knowing that person. And in a way, that's what's unique. I mean, Lennon was asked in the early 70s by a crazy fan that actually broke into his uh, house and was crazy, and he thought that all the songs were written about him. And then he said, he said no, I just write about my life. I just write about me and my girlfriend and my problems, and my, I just write about what my issues are. And the fact is that so many millions of people felt like he was writing to them and about them. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Would you also say that it's um, uh, because they're a different generation, they are more um, Joel Gamzu's generation, would you also say, because you early, early on in this conversation you said, it's wonderful because you are going to experience decades of more cooperation, eh, more Gesamtkunstwerk, sort of. Um, is there something of a, maybe, maybe not a jealousy, but sort of a melancholy in choosing this younger generation artists where you think you know no. there's they have so much bef before them no no N not for me no N no because i don't feel old <laughs> no. and no but uh, it's just like no i i think it's fabulous you know that there is a new generation okay. of authors mm -hmm. that 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 one is from Taipei, the other one is from France, the other one is from Vietnam, but living in America, that, they, that there is a, a strange connection. So that's not, that's not a coincidence. No. You know, at this moment that this pops up and that also editors are suddenly interested in publishing it because these novels are really, uh, they get nominated at prizes, awards. You know, it's not like people are reading it. You yeah. know, they find really an audience because of the editors that are interested in publishing it. You know, that's what it is. No, no, it's just like I'm, all, I'm, I'm looking ahead, but also back. And I think, you, you know, there, you have to be aware as an artist, there is all, always generations be, uh, that are coming after you. But it's in a way also a little bit their, cur their own courage that gives merits that because people nowadays have, I think, there is space to be honest in a way that was less possible before. And in a way, I think those, I mean, people used to write, with exceptions, of course, so much more about, let's say, settings that were far away from themselves. Writing about your own life with such incredible, painful honesty is not something that was, I think, 30, 40 years ago, although I didn't live at that time, but from the works that I know, okay. that was called for. Um, and I think the fact that it's, there is space for that and that, it's, that people encounter those people with empathy also gives space for people like that to do it. You hear a lot of the opposite, actually. You hear a lot of people complaining about the fact that you're not allowed to say anything anymore, that there's sort of political correctness. That yeah, I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I think that we've, uh, it's a fine line. It's a very, very fine line between, but it's, it's, uh, it's never, it's, it should always be about empathy, but it should not be about hypocritical empathy. But that's a whole other matter. We'll talk about that for hours. <laughs> and it's but, about being victim or not. And that's, as he said, it's always a choice. Yeah. It always is. Yeah. You earlier today said, you know, a difficult youth is also a gift, a special gift, because yeah. it allows sure. you. 
I mean, uh, looking at this fragment, I was thinking about what you said earlier today. Mm. I think people create out of different um, sources. And I think people have different, let's say, mechanisms that may give them the need to do so. And I mean, for me personally, I mean, a big, let's say, engine that brought me to music was pain in a lot of ways. And I think nobody wants to see pain on stage, but I find a way to sublimate my own pain into music. That was my personal escape from what I went through. But it was also, it resulted in my need to pursue music in a way that was almost obsessive. No, not almost, it was obsessive. And I think different artists have different reasons for why they've come into it. They've escaped things, they've looked for a home, they've looked for, they've, there were different mm, sources to why they, they came to it. But in a way, there are so many ways to sublimate a personal experience into something that is valuable to others. But it has to be a sublimation for it to become valuable for others. It cannot be just self-therapy. Which actually, I mean, did you remember we talked a few days ago about, uh, about one question I'd really like to ask him? I don't know if we still have time for that. Yeah, we do. Go ahead. Do, can I? It's yeah. a completely different topic, and I'm going I'm to switch You didn't it. ask me to ask a question to him, no, so... No, you didn't ask me to. I just wanted to. Okay, tell me. I hope that's no, it's but you, actually, but it's you not, can, of course. Probably. It's not actually something that I want to ask. Like, I want to talk to you about it. Let's put it this way. It's not like... And I'm curious what your take on it is, because it's something that... If, it's a topic that has been keeping me busy for a long time now, which is, I mean... A little bit we touched upon when we talked about the word entertainment. Uh, you, so I'm jumping back now an hour, in a way. Um, and sort of having lived in Germany now for about more than 10 years, we, and you live in this bubble with, where people don't even realize how fortunate they are to get basically completely state-funded and have these incredible budgets to create freely. Um, and you're constantly encouraged to make art that is, that is socially critical, that in this, that, and the other, and you look down upon if you create art that is, or if you create something that's just entertaining because that is seen as something that is commercial. And I, for, for me, you're one of the examples that are most striking about something that is completely managed to produce high art in an entertainment setting. And which is for me actually not at all a, a contradiction, rather the contrary, in a way, I, I said to you yesterday, I think Mozart never saw himself as anything but an entertainer. He just happened to write the greatest pieces of music by doing so. And, um, and it reminds me, of an experience that I had, and it's funny enough because a friend of mine is, who came late is, uh, is here with us today, and we went to a show in, in Germany about a year ago of a musical that was um, the most typical, let's say, cliche commercial musical in a private theater that is not meant to do anything except sell a lot of tickets and entertain people. And I remember coming out of that show and I was completely blown away. And I just thought, wow, I'm just being more moved than by anything I've seen in a state-funded artsy theater for the past five years. And I thought, okay, you never know because you, know, you always have, people can effectively push your buttons and it doesn't make it great art. But then it kept on keeping me busy for weeks after that and I still kept on thinking about that show, which was not trying to do anything except entertain me, that was keeping me busy for weeks to go. And I thought, when was the last time I came out of an opera house or a theater? <laughs> and I was still emotionally moved and intellectually challenged by something that I saw for weeks afterwards, probably a long time ago, to put it mildly. And it made me wonder, what is this, is it, what is this uh, contradiction between entertainment and art? But for me, there is no contradiction. I know. Well, say, curious you know, what do you think about that? Yeah. Because for me, it was, it was weird to realize that something that is, that, you know, that I work in a place which is completely fully state funded, which of course we all scream to the government all the time, give us more money, give us more money, we need money, okay. Yeah, that's true. And then we produce stuff that completely ignores 99% of the world. And that usually makes me feel very little. And then I go to a place where people stand on stage and never in their lives imagine they're producing, they're becoming the, producing the greatest art in the world. They just want to give people a good time and pro provide a service. Yeah, but that's also a misunderstanding, I think. Okay. You know? but, well, anyway, I, I work in, in, the, in the commercial theater in London and in New York. That's my experience. Uh, it's not different. It's not the, 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 but I, I'm lucky because I work with the best producers, you know, really the best of the best. That's Scott Rudin in New York, that's Sonia Friedman in, uh, and Robert Fox, who did Lazarus uh, uh, in, uh, in London. Uh, they are the best. So these people, they don't want to make shit, you know, they really want to make good work. But they, for instance, the last production commercially that I did was West Side Story. It, is, uh, it was in a house of 1,700 people. 1,700, 1,700. For people here, that's carré plus. Huh? So that's big, and it plays eight times a week. So, you know, I thought 
because the idea came from me in this case. I went to the producer. I want to do West Side Story, West Side Story for the 21st century. So I made immediately my things clear. Uh, so I, I, I want new choreography, which was forbidden in New York. That was that ha hasn't happened in 70 years. So that was my my demand. Uh, and I said, I want the Jets not to be white Americans. I want the Jets to be the America of today. So a different. So then four estates had, had uh, the estate of Bernstein, the estate of Arthur Lawrence, the writer, go on. You know, four estates had to, uh, had to, had to, say, to, the, to, had to the, give the, me the rights yeah. to, to do that, you know, uh, and some time, of course, and all these things. So, but my producer really believed in that idea. And he really believed that this could bring something new a new vision to a work that everybody knew in New York, New York, and he supported me in doing that. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I made a production as I would make it here, you know, in, in my own theater. It's, for me, it's totally the same. Of course, the resources are a little bit big. <laughs> you know, it is, I don't know how much it costs, but it was huge uh, uh, because it's enormous lot of people on stage. But, you but know, you know basically, I mean for me, that. the work is, is, is totally the same. And the way that I work is totally the same. But looking at it from a perspective, you know what I mean in terms and of people the pressure don't go, of... You know, because I was known in New York as the off-Broadway uh, director. You know, mm. the guy from off-Broadway. That means the small theaters, they're experimental. You know, they call it an experimental, you know, what, which I don't know what it means, but okay. Uh, but then suddenly, you know, they saw that the theater that I was making in the small spaces in New York was, became in the big space and it was as if it was, had been there for ages. So is it about quality? Listen, people, uh, uh, there has been a change eh, because it used to be much more musical, musical, musical for musical sake. But I discovered also that when I started talking to Scott, but also I, had, I was so lucky that I could meet sometime because he's still alive and very much so. For them, the, the Americans culturally invented a few things, jazz, you know, a few things, eh? jazz, modern dance, they invented that eh, in the 70s. It comes from, from, from New York. And they invented the musical. The musical for them is a cultural heritage. They know, for them it's like Shakespeare, to be or not to be. You know, every song in West Side Story, for them it's like something, you know, they know by heart, they know what it means, they know why it's there. They really know the work deep. So I was totally overwhelmed by that when I came. And I was a little bit in the beginning, I thought, why did I start this? You know, because I'm, I know the least of, but that became my strength. Because I was a little bit naive, and, but also therefore open to the work. And I discovered things in these songs that nobody, I th well, I think wanted to see. For instance, there is this famous song, Gee, Mr. Krupke, uh, uh, Officer Krupke. And that's, I, I said immediately, that's about uh, police violence on the street, you know? But it was before whatever, what, what happened. Well, that became a huge thing. I can say it here within the confinement that sometime a week and before the premiere still wanted it that I changed my, my, my staging and, staged, and, that, and, and I said, no, it's comic relief. I said, Stephen, comic relief. Two people dead on stage, you know, 10 minutes ago. What, we are heading for another murder within 10 minutes. Comic relief. I cannot But then this. we get back again to the same topic. He, what, he, what he's representing is the world that thinks that people are paying money to get entertained. Well, in this case, you could say yes, but he gave in. And my thing happened, sure, you know, and then th three weeks later, there was a guy on the street, you know, and now it's like as, as if I predicted that moment, you know, mm. and that's, it's, it's, so also in that world, that's what I want to say. It's a serious world where people take every song, the, the, the book of, of West Side Story is very small. If you put all the lines, you know, it's only like uh, perhaps 10 pages, I don't know, but not, not much more. But there's a lot there. And if you, if you take it serious, this, this material and the songs and why are the songs there, then it becomes like a piece of art. That's the way how I see it. And how did you manage that with Lazarus where it's a little bit harder to take the, 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 the text as a piece of art as it is in West well, Side Story? But then perhaps, no, I, I don't agree. Yeah, of course I don't agree because I was at the, at the birth of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah? You know, we made it together. Uh, uh, and I think the text is, uh, uh, every scene that's there is, has a meaning within the story. And of course, that's a different, different story from the West Side Story because 
Bowie's, uh, the, the world of David Bowie is not a world where stories happen logically. Mm. So, but what I discovered very early on is that this, this whole production was to him very personal. He had a daughter of 13 at that moment. Mm -hmm. So there, that's why there is a girl of 13, she is in that, in that story. So there's a lot of things which I immediately felt, you know, it's very personal and it's very close uh, to him. So for me, I, could, I can explain every scene. I can, for me, it's not nonsense. I know that a lot of people gave, uh, criticized. Uh, no, no, I didn't mean it's nonsense. I just meant that the songs were there before the text. In a sense, not all of them. Not all of them. Eh? Four were written uh, specifically for the production. Mm -hmm. Four are, uh, yeah, and the, and the others are in the, indeed chosen to match. But but four were new. A way of asking your question might be, um, what's the difference between high and low art? You know, what's mm -hmm. the difference between subsidized art and and, and musicals, which are yeah, but just this is an old dis exactly. I think and, this and, is and really you're an giving an answer to that. Yeah, but also yeah. even and I can say it in Amsterdam when I when I started. I, I, when I was asked to do the Holland Festival, mm -hmm. end of the 90s, we are talking about 97, then I opened with a rock concert. Well, I remember uh, when the Volkskrant announced my program, they put, uh, just as, a, as an ironical uh, comment on my program, uh, an accordion. How do you say that in English? Accordion. So, like you say accordion. A, accordion, ten accordion players. It mm -hmm. was. It was no accordion uh, concert in my whole program. It was just like, because that was the time that I that I brought music of Frank Zappa, Zappa, all these things. You know, John Zorn came. You know, all these things. So that was breaking. That was breaking banging the, the borders. But it was yeah. not accepted at that moment. But in, exactly, in exactly what I mean. I mean, I completely agree with you, and I think we agree on this completely. But if we just for a second, if you you take away those people like yourself that are the exception to the rule, you would probably agree with me that a huge part of the mainstream scene sees it like that. That the moment yeah. that a project has to, but that's changing. To, I think I know, that's I know, changing. I know, but what I'm trying to understand is just the mechanism of why the moment something has to function commercially it makes it automatically artistically invalid and the moment that something and some people even think that things that are not functioning commercially almost makes them artistically valid which is even more absurd but yeah. but why is but i the, think in germany that's much more extreme i know i know i know it, which is why i'm asking yeah. you because i'm curious what where do you think it comes from why are we where where did it start that we think entertaining is a lower task I don't know because Brecht also made musicals eh, already in his old. But leave the musicals, just the idea of entertaining, the idea of people going to the theater. Well, but I, I don't relate to it, so I don't know. And I, you know, I have a very complicated uh, relationship with German and German theater. Uh, you know, so I, I don't work there very often anymore. Uh, uh, I, I rather I, work. I don't, in, I don't blame you, but. Yeah. Well, but I never no, said that because there is a certain political dimension, which is like, you have to do it this way, you know, and that's what I don't like. I, 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 I feel very much more alive artistically in, in other places like France, like uh, 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 London and, and, and in America, because there is in, indeed, uh, they can accept much more that, that things, uh, that you go from one world into another mm -hmm. world, you know, as, as you call it so, because for me it feels the same. Well, here I did the Lazarus, <laughs> you know, I, I run the biggest subsidized theater in Holland here, which is, and at the, other side of the, yeah. at the other side of the street, there is the most important uh, commercial theater. I did the Lazarus mm -hmm. there. And not in your own And everybody theater. said, yeah. they're going to kill you here. I said, no, I think by now everybody accepted, you know, that this is, this is the new world. You know, there is not, is David Bowie commercial? Yes, of course. He has millions. He had millions when he died, you know. Of course it's commercial. He make, he had, he's made a lot of money. But I think, I know, because I looked him into the face that every song that this man has written is written for personal reasons. Mm. It's not just a song. Of course, he had also sometimes a mode that I want to make, make a hit now, but, but the, the body of his work is really, I asked him about songs that he has written 50 years ago. He knew exactly, you know, what it related to and, Would, you know, things no, like I mean, I think every song of David Bowie is high art. It's not the point, but... Yeah, but, but it's also commercial. Eh? For sure, but the question, there is a certain fear among lots of, let's say, if you think politically, of people that think that the moment that something is, the moment the public chooses through success, it becomes, in a way, the wrong criteria. That the moment that people are left to choose with whether they, something is popular or not, the wrong criteria wins. 
And the question, of course, it's a, if it's a, it's a, it's somehow a spectrum because if it would, when if art would just be allowed to happen according to what is successful, there would be lots of problems because then we'd, you'd have to go to a, a different common denominator. But still, there is a certain fear of, uh, and I find it fascinating because to me it's actually almost counterintuitive because art was created for people to start with, and I and we live in a time where almost art is created against people. So, so I, and that's the other thing. Eh? The other thing is, I think. To make uh, uh, art for 50 people is not less valuable than making art for hundred thousands of yeah, people. Of course, you yeah. know, there is not for me. There is no dif there is no difference. It just you, becomes, you have yeah. to, well, For me, it's important that listen with the West Side Story. I would never have been thinking of doing it here. Uh, I I wanted to do it in New York. You know in the circumstances where it was created and bring a new vision to it, another vision to it. And I thought it fitted a big, also because I had the choice between a smaller theater and a bigger theater. And I, I chose for the big theater, not because it wasn't more people, but just because I knew if I, can, if I can make it here, then the work will be at its best. You know, and that's what I do. I try to choose the, 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 the circumstances uh, to do the things that I want to do, you know, and it's in France, I would do different things from here or from, uh, uh, yeah, that's what it is. It might be very telling um, that uh, when you were asked to uh, come to Zomergast, a very popular television program, you brought Walt Disney as well. Yeah, it started, yeah. Yeah. With Bambi. And Sorry? Bambi. Yeah. Well. As, a, as, a, as a real work of art. For me, it is. Yeah. But yeah. why and, is that and it's, surprising? It's very telling, I would say, uh, as an answer to your question. Um, I think it's. Yeah, but I, I was, grow, I was growing up always with this crossing. No, in, I, I understand. I, I, for me, it was like so strange that suddenly I was in a world like your subsidized theater, and that's that. I, I never have been thinking that way, and I refuse to do that. So that might be the answer to it. Mm -hmm. I still don't know why that musical in Germany moved me more than all the stuff I see in subsidized theaters, but maybe I'll just have to live with that doubt. I don't think Ivo can give you an answer to that no. specific experience, but um, more in general, yes. Um, I'm um, wanting to thank you both for a long and very interesting and very honest conversation on the art of performing uh, on stage, bringing art to a stage and where it comes from and what it is, what you try to do. Um, we've been trying to do that on stage here tonight. Thank you very much for joining into this experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Experiment and experience. Um, thank you very much for being here and listening to us. Um, we have uh, two more artist talks with Joel Gamsu to go uh, s somewhere in this season. Um, and I hope COVID will not uh, prevent us from doing that because um, as we try to touch on tonight, um, there's probably hardly anything as important as uh, live performances uh, for human beings who are uh, beings of flesh and blood to meet each other on the stage. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining the conversation, both Thank of you. you. Thank you.